Okay. I have a demo for us. I've got these two bottles here. Uh, and it'll take me a little bit to do this demo, so I might start the next chapter a little bit while things are happening. Uh, and they're both 250 milliliter volumetric flasks. So that means the volume of each liquid is 250 milliliters. Okay, there we go. What I'm going to do is put them in a 500 <coughs> milliliter flask. So I'm going to start just pouring it in like this. And uh, there, one's bluish, as you can see, one's yellow. That's just because of the food coloring. So you can see, uh, so you can see it a little bit more easily. But I'm going to pour both of these in here. So that's what I'm going to work on. It'll take a little bit. So while we're doing that, I'll show you the next chapter info. Uh, chapter 13. We have this. Uh, so that's what we're going to cover next in chapter 13. There's solution, just like this is solution. And I'll re-go over the definition of that. But one of the first things we're going to talk about when we talk about solutions uh, is concentration. Okay, so I've got all the first one in there. The first one, the yellow that you saw was water. This blue one, uh, this is ethanol. This is some people's favorite liquid right here. Uh, so we're mixing water and ethanol all together. Okay? And we're going to kind of see what happens when we mix these together. What kind of reaction or whatever uh, is going to happen when they're mixed. But they're forming, as you can imagine, their own solution. Okay, almost got it. All right, so I got this all mixed up. Take a look at this. Of course, it's kind of greenish looking. Now, here's what I want to point out, though. We're going to, yeah, I'm going to have to look at me for a second, unfortunately. Okay, can you see that kind of green there? Okay, see where my fingers are. See that? That's a 500 mark. You see what happened now? Just 250 plus another 250 is not 500. It's about that much lower, about not quite 10% lower, but it's lower. What's that? <laughs> Wait, any ideas what just happened? Why is this not, what the heck? Why is this not 500? And I will tell you right now, no reaction has occurred. There's no reaction that has occurred whatsoever. It is still water and still ethanol. Yeah, what's up? It did, but more importantly, the, you're getting on the right track. The hydrogen bond in the water, it's not going to say hydrogen bond into itself anymore. It's hydrogen bond into the ethanol, which is a strong bond, and it causes it to contract more than you would expect. So the hydrogen bonding caused the contraction of a few percent thus causing this to drop lower than what we expected. So it's not quite 500. So it's in fact a volume change. Pretty interesting. Can I have what? One more time, yes. Uh, ethanol and water both have OH groups. Those OH groups hydrogen bond with each other, causing uh, if you have one side is ethanol, one side is water, it's constrict a little bit because that bond is so strong. Because of that constriction actually causes a volume. The volume is less than what we expect. Is that all right? Good. Good question. Pretty interesting, huh? We're going to do another demo like that later in the quarter. All right. Let's move on and do a little bit more of this chapter. So again, we're in chapter 13. Uh, liquids and solids. No, wait, that was last chapter. Solutions, solutions. Okay. Whenever you have what's called a homogeneous mixture of two uh, entities, two substances, that's what we call a solution. In 2A, 
those were always two liquids, usually. They do not have to be two liquids. It can be a solid liquid or gas as a solute, and a solid liquid or gas as a solvent. So I want to give you a handful of examples of this. And uh, by the way, we're on page 562 of the textbook, and the reader, uh, the chart I just showed you is 32, but now we're moving on to page 33. Okay, so what we're going to do is make a little table. Remember, the solute is what there's less or more of. There's less of the solute. Whatever there is more of is called a solvent. And let's do an example. Okay, let's say we have a gas and in a gas. A gas and another gas, that's what an example would be humidity. Okay, so water in air. Uh, let's say a liquid in a gas, that's rain. Okay, that's the solution. A solid in a gas, an example would be snow. Okay, now let's make the solvent a liquid. Gas in a liquid. That would be any soda, where you have CO2 dissolved in the, in the uh, liquid. Uh, let's do a liquid in a liquid. Tons of that, gin and tonic, whatever. You don't even know what that is, I understand. Solid and liquid, you'll know later when you're 21. Okay, solid and liquid. Uh, this would be like salt water. This is where you put solid salt in water and it dissolves, it becomes aqueous. Okay, let's move on now and do solids. Some examples of solid solvent. Let's do a gas in a solid. A sponge would be an example of that. Gas in a solid. A liquid in a solid would be, an example would be a filling. Like a dental filling. For example, some dental fillings are mercury, which is a liquid in silver, which is a solid. So that's a, it's an amalgam. Uh, oh, that's a liquid in a solid. And a solid in a solid. An example would be any alloy. Sterling silver. Uh, any metal in another metal. So any, oh that says, that looks terrible, but it says alloy. There we go. Okay, so those are some examples of uh, different solutions. Now, that was section one, just our little introduction. Let's move on to section two now. Section two, concentration. Concentration. There are many ways to express concentration. In Chem 2A, you actually learned a couple of them. Molarity is an example. I'll review that. I'll also review percent mass. You saw that. That's actually a concentration unit. You may have seen, if you did that homework, the suggested homework in 2A, you might have seen parts per million in there. That's another type of concentration. We'll see all of those, actually. And we're going to learn, let's see, how many? seven categories of concentration, each of which have subcategories. Brace yourself. Here we go. Stretch out the shoulders, whatever you need to do. Okay. We're going hardcore right now. Molarity. Some of this is reviewed, so uh, you won't be relearning things. Molarity. That is, and you want to get this stuff down, that's amount of solutes in units of moles. The units are significant. Per volume, of solution, volume of solution. Now, thinking back to the demo I just did, can you see why molarity is not always that great? Volume can change. Yeah, in fact, one area, another area that changes besides the demo, volume can change whenever temperature changes. So molarity is an okay unit, but it doesn't always work for us. So let's go to a second category here, uh, what I call the percent. The percents. Subcategory A, nice. Mass percent. This is the one you've learned already. This is the mass of the solute per mass of the solution times 100 to change it to percent. So you've learned that one before. B, here's a new one. Volume percent. Volume percent. Pretty similar though. It's the volume of the solute 
for the volume of the solution times 100. Okay, so, so far, A, you hopefully slightly remember, B is very similar, C is pretty similar too. It's the mass per volume percent. Like when will this end? This is the mass, as you might guess, the mass of the solute per the volume of the solution. Okay, units are important right here. This is grams on top and on bottom, not liters, but you need milliliters. Okay? Just how it's defined. How it's defined. Times 100. Okay, that's it for the percents. Let's go on to category three. We're going three of five, remember? Category three, I'll do in blue, uh, parts per blank. Whatever that blank is. Okay? Subcat, well, they're kind of subcategories, but let me say a little bit about it first. This is kind of like C, 2C. It's really a parts per blank is really a, a mass per volume percent, and in some cases a mass percent. So it's kind of like A and C from before. Uh, let me show you how. If we have one, uh, let's do let's do milligram first. One milligram per liter. That's what's called one ppm, or parts per million. Parts per million. What does that mean? That means there's one gram, if it's water, and you can convert from liters to water, one gram per one million grams. Okay. One gram of something per, one gram of solute per a million grams of solvent. So solute on top, solvent on the bottom, or solution on the bottom. I'll write that so that's clear. Solute and solution. Okay? Uh, if you have one microgram per liter, that's one parts per billion, and that's one gram of solute per billion grams of solution. And there's a third one to learn. Let's go to the next page for me. One uh, nanogram per liter is one PPT, not precipitate, but parts per trillion, which is one uh, gram per trillion uh, grams. Okay? So parts per million, billion, and trillion. This is, these are typically used environmentally for very, as you can see, low concentrations. Uh, I used to, sometimes I used to do research at uh, Brookhaven National Lab, which is near where they did all the Manhattan Project, and they still report for the area amounts of parts per billion, parts per trillion of tritium in the, uh, in the water, just as so locals can know how bad things are, or how it's improving, whatever your perspective is. Okay, uh, that's three. Let's go to number four. Number four, you've actually might have seen this in 2A. You should have seen it, uh, maybe depending on your instructor. Uh, number four, mole fraction. You should have seen this when you did Dalton's Law. And percent. So mole fraction and mole percent. What is that? It symbolizes X with a subscript, and that's the moles of I, which is typically the solute, but whatever I is, over the total moles, which is usually the moles of the uh, solution. Okay, so solute over solution is typically what that is, where, let's say there's I, J, and K in solution and whatever else, the sum of those mole fractions and any other mole fraction of any substance in solution will always equal one exactly. So for all solutions components, if you add up the mole fractions, they're going to equal one. The mole percent is basically just a hundred times the mole fraction. Now I'm not going to go into it, but there's actually a mass fraction and a mass percent. They're the same things, but you just put masses in here. 
And, and you know mass percent, actually. Okay, so that's the fourth one. Fifth one. Wait, how many, how many are we doing today? That's it. Yeah, fifth one. And here we go. Yeah, we're going to seven. Uh, let's get a new pen color out. Five. Molality. Not molarity, but molality. This is symbolized by lowercase m. Uppercase m is molarity. Lowercase m is molality. Now get these units. They're kind of funky. The amount of solute in moles, we're kind of used to that, over the mass of solvent, not solution. And that's in kilograms. This is moles per kilogram. Uh, and it's not solute per solution like every other thing. This is solute per solvent. That's important. We like this unit is actually kind of superior to the molarity unit in that when temperature changes, this won't change. So we like that over molarity for that reason. Though it's uh, sometimes a little clunky to calculate. Okay, that was number five. Let's go on to number six. And you're going to see this in the third week of lab, you'll see molality. It also comes back, of course, in this chapter. Number six, normality. Normality, capital N. Capital N. Uh, there's different ways to define this. This is how I'm going to define it. It's the molarity, capital M, times the number of equivalents. which is probably not very helpful. What's the number of equivalents? This is typically used for uh, various kinds of concentration. Acids, bases, sometimes redox. So for example, I'll just show you a little example here on this one. Uh, let's say we had uh, 3.0 molar H2SO4. 3.0 molar H2SO4. Well, this has two equivalents. That means two hydrogens to donate as an acid. And so if I multiply the molarity by two, this is 6.0 normal H2SO4. Okay. Number of equivalents is the number of H pluses in this case. If there were OH minuses, you can multiply by the number of OH minuses for a base, that sort of pattern. Okay, finally, number seven. Blue that in blue. And we'll see this again in the chapter. Solubility is actually a type of concentration. And this is the grams of solute dissolved. So whatever you're dissolving. And there's actually different ways to define solubility. This is just the way your book uses. And then over the given mass, that's mass, not molality, mass or volume of solvent, typically. To be defined in other ways, that's just one way to define it that we'll use here. All right, we made it. Nice. OK, any questions on those? Next class, we're going to keep going, but next class we'll do an example with that. If you want to see a YouTube on it, though, sooner than later, you can watch the concentrations. I'll give you a big hint for the exam. I have not failed to ever, uh, to, I, okay, that's to me never ever. Okay. I have always, I'll say in the closet, had this question on an exam where I give you one unit and you have to convert to all the others or most of the others. Okay? So, I, I'm telling you ahead of time. Look at the practice exams. I, and here's the reason I always do it because people always miss it. Even though it's just a calculation, if you can learn it, you're going to get a free at least 10 points on this one. Okay? So, this is something to learn. Learn how to do these conversions. I always have it on the exam. It's, the conversions are on the exam. Uh, you'll see, I, they're usually, uh, he's asking what kind they are, they're usually in a table. You'll see what I mean when you look in the practice exams. You'll see them there. They're, 
they they usually come in a short answer form. Okay, that was your big camp for the day. Hope you were listening. Huh? Hi. I don't see you, but go ahead. Oh, hi, there you are. Yes. Oh, how do you tell the difference between M and M? Uh, lowercase, which is mass and molality. Uh, well, in this case, I just told you. But uh, it hopefully should be unit uh, obvious based on the context. Which one are we talking about? Intermolecular forces are back. And solutions, of course, because this is the solution chapter. Section 3. Here's our general rule. Oh, that might be hard to read because it's green or in difficult. General rule is this. Like dissolves like. What does that mean? Now that means if you have a nonpolar substance, It'll dissolve in another nonpolar substance. If you have a polar substance, it'll dissolve in another polar substance. So you got to remember, polar means there's a dipole of some sort, whether a hydrogen bond or a regular permanent dipole. Nonpolar, anything that has just London would probably be nonpolar if there's no dipole. No dipole is nonpolar. Uh, let me give you some examples. If you put, if you go to your friend's car and you pour some water in the gas tank, that's not going to be good for your friend, but it might be funny for you. And the reason is gas is nonpolar, water is polar, they don't mix. And so the engine's going to misfire. Um, we don't use DDT anymore in the U.S. to kill mosquitoes. Why? Because it's fat-soluble. And you all are fat. And so it will dissolve in your skin as well and be harmful to you. Uh, have you ever heard of like a, a barium milkshake? Has anybody heard of that? That's when you check out your GI tract and you take this milkshake. You can also take the other way, the enema, whatever way you prefer, I guess, and it uh, looks at your GI tract. The problem is uh, barium is toxic, but at the right concentration, it doesn't dissolve uh, in your skin. Uh, Another example, vitamins. Uh, if you take a, too much vitamin C, you just urinate it out because it's water soluble. Okay, so it goes out in water. Those are some examples of like dissolves like. Okay, now let's talk about that in terms of solution. We have another delta H to be friends with. Delta H of solutions. This can be greater than zero, less than zero. What do you think this greater than zero is called? What thermic? endothermic, and this of course would be exothermic, just like before. So the top one, when the top solution forms, if the enthalpy is greater than zero, you would feel a cold solution. In the bottom case, the solution would feel hot. Okay, there are three factors in delta H of solution. Let's learn those three factors. Factor one, this again is for delta H of solution. Is it called expanding the solute? Expanding the solute. And let me just show you this. Let me see. I think I brought something in here. Maybe. I'll look around. Expanding the solute. Where's my magnet still? Okay. Let me show my magnet. Oh, they're stuck to my crystal lines. Okay. When you're expanding the solid, uh, solute, expand, uh, imagine this is the solute. To expand it, because they're magnets, you know they go together, right? Well, I need to exert a force to expand them. Okay? That's factor one. I need to put in energy to expand these. Okay. Let's do factor two. Likewise, expanding... The solvent. Okay. Same reason. These two are together. They're with each other. You need to put in force to pull them apart. Is that okay? Because they're attracted to each other, just like magnets. All right. They don't always have to be like that, but 
for the illustration purposes. Three, form solution. OK, in this case, let's say the solute is the white one, and the solvent is the green one. So solvent's on the right. When I form the solution, there can often be some level of attraction. They go together automatically. So in this case, energy is given off. Energy is given off in the third case. So what does that mean in terms of enthalpy? Delta H of solution is equal to delta H for step one, expanding the solute, delta H for step two, expanding the solvent, and delta H for step three, uh, forming the solution. Okay, these two, first two, greater or less than zero? Did I put in energy or take away energy? I put it in, so it better be greater than zero. And do you remember how energy was given off when the two collided in the third case? This is less than zero. Okay, so the first two steps, you need energy to separate them. Last step, energy is given off when they come together and collide. I one time, I don't know why, I had a dream about delta H of solution in the swimming pool. It's pretty exciting. Now, sometimes, okay, that's random. Delta H of solution is zero. Don't worry, I don't say that in public. Okay. If delta H of solution is zero, we call this, just like an ideal gas, this is an ideal solution. This occurs whenever the solute and solvent have little attraction with each other or uh, itself. So there's little attraction, uh, then you'll get what's called an ideal solution, where there's no forces to worry about between the molecules. And so this often happens with organic mixtures. So when there's carbons and hydrogens mixed together, those are typically what we call ideal solutions. No heat would be given off in any way. Okay, I will. I uh, want to draw your attention to something here. Uh, I won't talk about this in class, but the top of page 37, if you have my reader, I think this used to be in the text too, but I, I haven't seen it recently unless they moved it around. Uh, I don't know where this table went. They used to have this in the text. Uh, but you can take a look at this if you want. This is, you can actually derive. Uh, the like versus like idea. Okay? So uh, basically what this table derives is that if you have two nonpolars, a solution will form, and if you have two polar uh, entities, a solution forms. So uh, just so you can see that derivation, if you want to take a look at it, you can look there. Uh, but I think this is a good place to end. I'll show you one more YouTube video. If you want to check out missability, uh, that'll be a common question. Otherwise, we're done, and I'll see you next time. See you as well, YouTube people.